On this episode of What's Going On With Shipping, Peter Zeehan talks the Jones Act, we better call Sal. Hi, I'm the aforementioned Sal McCogliano. Welcome to this episode. So, this is not the first time I've had to do Better Call Sal with Peter Zeehan. It's our second episode that we've done that, as a matter of fact. But this episode was, or this video, was brought to my attention by a viewer, and I can't help but notice that Peter Zeehan has got a real burr under his saddle for the Jones Act. And, which is fine, you can have a different opinion about the Jones Act. And for those of you who don't know, the Jones Act is the Merchant Marine Act of 1920. Specifically, what he's talking about is Section 27 of the Jones Act, which deals with something called cabotage, which is the movement of goods, U.S. goods, between U.S. ports, which can only be done on a ship that is U.S. built, U.S. owned, U.S. flagged, and U.S. crewed. If you are not any of those four, you can't move the cargo between U.S. ports. And Peter Zeehan does not like the Jones Act. He, matter of fact, will say the Jones Act is the cause for a lot of problems, along with many other people. However, I have some, some, some issues with what Peter says in this talk. Now, this is a talk he gave just the other day down in Shreveport, Louisiana, to BRF Louisiana. BRF is building f uh, our regional future, so a kind of development group that's looking to grow Shreveport and Louisiana. And so I want to address some of the issues he has in this. Before we go any further, hey, take a moment. Subscribe to the channel, hit the bell, so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. All right, better call Sal. These solid red lines are where the urban center stops because of geography. The dotted are where the cost of expansion goes up. Check out you guys in the middle. I mean, yes, you've got like a protected wetland right there, but honestly, it's so small you can go around it. One of the big things to keep in mind if your intent is to change the economic destiny of your locality is, you know, taking an accurate stock of your assets and your liabilities. Okay, I agree with that. You got to take a good stock of what you have in and around your area. And taking a really good hard look at your local geography and your regional geography. And in okay, this is where I'm going to have an issue with Peter because I got an issue with his geography. In your case, there are no real limits to where you can go. You've got some of the cheapest land in the country. You've got access to a river. Yeah, but that river isn't what you think it is, Peter. But there are a couple of problems. The first one, the most significant one, is you're close to New Orleans. And that's not because everyone's gonna go party there on a Thursday, no, 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 no. no. Why not? The problem is, is New Orleans is the world's largest bulk export terminal. And okay. so anything that was in about 600 miles of it, the decision has been made over and over and over and over to just not move up the value added chain. Produce a raw commodity, ship it to New Orleans, they send it over the horizon and that's the end of the story. Okay, but they're also developing a huge new container port, which was in the news, which is going to substantially change things. But anyway, let's keep going. It's cheap, it's easy, it's boring, and it limits what you can do. Sure, why that's boring. Now I wanna compare a few other zones that I've worked with at the po in the past, just to give you an idea. So this is. So Peter talked about here. I jumped forward just a little bit in the video, and I'll have the full video so you can take a look at it. He talked about the Pacific Northwest, Seattle, and now he's talking about Charleston, two areas he's worked with. And again, he's comparing Shreveport to Seattle and Charleston, and this is what he has to say about those issues. And they're an ocean port. Why is the ocean port important? Because of what is arguably the dumbest law we have in the United States today. Okay, hang on a second. Can I be clear? You may not like the Jones Act for a variety of reasons, but th that's fine. But the dumbest law in the United States? I, 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 I differ. I mean, come on. There, there are dumb laws in the United States. There are ridiculously dumb laws. You're not allowed to have a goat in your house in Pocatello, Idaho. That's not a dumb law. I mean, there are dumb laws everywhere, Peter, but okay, I'll, I'll, I'll give it. You think it's the dumbest law? Okay, go ahead. The Jones Act was passed during the Great Depression. Okay, no, it wasn't. The Great Depression starts in 1929. The Jones Act is passed in 1920. As a matter of fact, the Jones Act was passed during a height of economic prosperity for the United States. And again, this is Again, I know it's a slight issue, but when you don't get the context of why a law is passed, it's really important. The U.S. had just come out of World War I. 
we had found ourselves at the mercy of foreign shipping for our international freight. In 1914, the British Merchant Marine, the German Merchant Marine, the French Merchant Marine, the Italian Merchant Marine, all disappeared from our ports because of World War I, and our goods piled up on our docks. What saved us, the only thing that saved us was we had the third largest Merchant Marine in the world, and the reason we had the third largest Merchant Marine in the world is because it was involved in our coastal trade. And I also don't understand why this ship right here, this ship right here, is a Dutch ship. I don't know why we're using this, but anyway, I guess that's the image he had. But we'll go ahead with it. Okay. Again, dumbest law we've ever had and started in the Great Depression. Again, both wrong in my opinion, but anyway. The idea was to protect American positions in maritime commerce. And it says that no cargo can be transported between any two American ports unless the ship carrying the cargo is American built, owned, captained, and crewed. And flagged, flagged. Captain and crew are the same thing, but anyway, go. As a result, shipments between American ports has dropped by 99% in value. Now, what, what does that mean? Drop 99% in value. How do you measure that? How do you measure from 1920 to 2023, 99% of the value? And, and can I be clear a minute? The, there are other issues at play here from 1920 to 2023 that have affected interstate shipping for example I, i'll just come up with one off the top of my head the interstate highway system peter i mean we didn't have the interstate highway system in 1920. the interstate highway system moves a great deal of cargo from port to port onto interstate highways and that seems fairly important what's another thing they had oh the interstate pipeline system that's a fairly important thing now you don't have to haul oil from Houston, Texas up to New York all the time because you have not one, not two, not three, but four pipelines that do it. We have pipelines that cross everywhere. What else do we have that has happened since 1920 that has impact our coastal shipping? Oh, let me say, here's one. Aircraft, jet aircraft, passenger liners come into effect. Now that doesn't sound like it moves freight, but it actually does because a lot of the cargo that's moved on board planes is high value cargo. Why are you paying money for your baggage on most flights? Because they want to get your bag out of the cargo bins so they can put cargo in there. What else does it do? It takes people off trains and now opens up trains for moving cargo. So let's be clear about something here. The Jones Act is not responsible for the decline of freight between U.S. cities. Where was the population of the United States in 1920? It was all concentrated in the Northeast. Now it's spread out across the country. And again, the geography of the U.S. is much different than Europe. So there are a lot of other factors here that have a play. And can I also mention, too, that all the world's merchant marines across the board, Britain, France, Germany, Italy, Netherlands, you name it, have all declined. They don't have the Jones Act. So the Jones Act is usually the catch-all for all things being wrong. But again, I, I will let Peter talk over the last century. And one of the reasons you guys do not see ships on the Red River every single minute is because of that law. No, no, that is not why that happens. Can I be clear about that? That is so wrong. Okay, freaking time out, time out, time out a second, because this is just, this, this, this is killing me right now. The man is in Shreveport, Louisiana, Shreveport, Louisiana. He is saying that the reason you don't see ships in the waterfront of Shreveport, Louisiana, is because of the Jones Act. Really? Really, Peter? All right. First off, the word, the name of the town you're in, last name of the word, port. The first part, Shreve. Who the frick is Henry Shreve? If you know who Henry Shreve is, you know this answer is wrong, Peter. Here you go. Who made America? Henry Miller Shreve. River rights and navigation. The frontiersmen help tra people travel and trade in the nation's interior by opening up the only viable highways, American rivers. He sued or was part of the suit against Henry uh, against Robert Fulton for trying to monopolize the rivers of the United States. Most one of the most famous cases in the Supreme Court, Gibbons versus Ogden, is Henry Shreve plays with that. He also develops the first successful river steamboat, the Enterprise, that is used on the ocean, uh, the waters there. This is the Enterprise. It creates the, it's the template for all future river boats. It has a 
boiler. It has a flat bottom boat. Why do you have a flat bottom shallow draft river boat? Because you're working on rivers in the in interior of the United States and they're shallow as crud. So you have that. Why do you have a big paddle wheel in the back and not paddle wheels on the side? Because you don't want the paddle wheel hitting the bottom. You don't want it hitting snags. You don't want to hit everything. So Henry Shreve creates the modern riverboat so you can get a riverboat from Louisiana, New Orleans, St. Louis, Louisville, Cincinnati, Pittsburgh, all the way up to Shreveport, Louisiana. He does this. He also comes up with a way to cut snags in the front. He comes up with a vessel called the Heliopolis which is designed to cut snags, these underwater trees, so that you can move things. So first off, Henry Shreve opens up this entire area to shipping. But let's go back to the issue that you just said, is why do you not see ships out in front of Shreveport, Louisiana? Well, because he had to design a vessel like that, you can't get large vessels up to Shreveport. What do I mean? Well, here you go. Welcome to the Army Corps of Engineers, the J. Bennett Johnson Waterway. The project consists of a nine foot deep by 200 foot wide navigation channel. Nine foot deep, 200 foot wide navigation channel that commences at the confluence of the Old and Red Rivers and proceeds upstream for 236 miles to the Shreveport Boussier City area. Five navigation locks with usable dimensions of 84 feet wide by 705 foot long, provide the necessary lift of approximately 141 feet. The locks can accommodate a standard six barge tow and a towboat in a single lockage. You can't bring ocean going ships up to Shreveport. You're not Charleston, you're not Seattle. You're Shreveport, Louisiana. You're not getting ocean going. You can't get deep draft ships above Baton Rouge on the Mississippi. So you are not going up to Shreveport, Louisiana. And again, what causes this? Well, let's look at the history section of this thing. Steamboats plying the Mississippi River could now, now go up the Red River to Shreveport and points north as well as west into Texas and along Cypress Bayou to Jefferson City, Texas. However, as the railroad commenced expanded in the late 1800s, steamboat commerce declined. Removal of the Red River raft caused the river to scour its channel deeper, making the river have unusually high banks. Because of these unnaturally high banks, bank erosion became a tremendous problem on the river. Thousands and thousands of acres of productive land would be eroded by the river and deposited downstream as less productive sandbars. This continual erosion also led to the shallowing of the river, making navigation treacherous. I did not see the word Jones Act anywhere in there, Peter. So what makes Shreveport not be a major river port has nothing to do with the Jones Act. It goes to geography, which you just talked about a minute ago. I am fine that you don't like the Jones Act. I'm fine with that. But don't tell people that the reason for their misfortune is this law when it has nothing at all to do with it. And one of the reasons you guys do not see ships on the Red River every single minute is because of that law but foreign ships that come to a port are exempt, so they all go to New Orleans. Can I be clear, that, that, that is wrong too, let me be clear. Foreign ships can come in and out of US ports all day long. They just can't move cargo between the ports. So you can get a ship that can go to New Orleans, Mobile, Miami, Jacksonville, it's fine. You can go ahead and drop cargo off all the time. But again, what Peter doesn't talk about here is that it is not cost effective to move goods between US ports on ships lots of times because it's just cheaper to put it on a truck and haul it on a truck. It really is. We subsidize the crud out of road and rail transportation like crazy in this country. While we complain, and I complain all the time about the cost for fuel and diesel, it is a heck of a lot cheaper than it is in a lot of countries overseas. We build a highway system. There's an interstate highway system in Hawaii. I've driven on H1, H2, H3. I've never yet found the off-ramp to get me to California. But we create an interstate highway system on those islands, yet we don't basically subsidize inner island transport. We don't do that. This is, again, one of the problems I have with Peter's take on the Jones Act, is that he kind of has this myopic, myopic view of the issue. He's just looking at the fact and not understanding it, I think, completely either at times. Any American port on a river has basically been gutted because of this law. So I've been fighting. The OK, so New York, New Jersey on the Hudson River has been gutted. It's the second largest port in the U.S. New Orleans is the largest 
bulk port in terms of tonnage in the United States. It's on a big river. It's called the Mississippi. It, it, it has nothing to do with it. It has to do with the issues of inland transportation and whether or not it's cheaper to move things on water or by, or faster and, and quicker on a truck. And this is the problem you have because, again, if you move things by port, it's double port handling. you got to take the container off the vessel. you got to load it onto a, another vessel. you got to take it off again when I could just put it on a truck in New Orleans and drive it to Shreveport up a highway that's to, there. Two interstate highways I could take going up there versus going through a lock and dam system that's going to take me a while. This very lonely one-man war against this stupid law for so long. Uh, he's not alone because there's a lot of other people who make arguments about this stupid law. He wants to make you think he's the only one talking about it, but he's not. I honestly think the Jones Act is the single biggest problem facing American development moving forward. The single biggest problem facing the United States development is the Jones Seriously, Peter? I mean, come on. Come on. You can't honestly believe that. I, I, I find that really difficult. And it's certainly a big issue for you because it means you can't follow the Charleston model. Because well, First off, I don't know what he talks about when he talks about the Charleston model because there's not a lot of commerce flowing up and down the Ashley and Cooper River. I've been there. Once you get above like the weapon station on, on the river, there's, you can't get above there. Charleston is a complete Charleston is different because of the massive population that's moving into the southeast right there. You don't have a massive population moving into northwest Louisiana. It's just not quite there yet. And again, Charleston is competing against Savannah, it's competing against uh, uh, Norfolk, it's competing against Jacksonville. There's a lot of issues going on. There's a reason those ports are developing. Ocean going vessels can't get this far. You need to have an American ship. And before you think, well, I like the idea of American ships. Can you imagine if we did this for any other mode of cargo? Yeah. Okay, here comes the rationalization then. I'm going to compare ships, the largest objects ever made by humans, with trains, planes, and cars. Air? That would remove 30% to 50% of the planes in the air. Okay, there are two aircraft manufacturers that make 91% of the world's aircraft, Boeing and Airbus. So, I, I mean, again, I, also, by the way, airplanes don't come around until 1903. Ships have been around forever. But, you know, again, okay, let's keep going. Truck? That would remove 80% of them. Okay, uh, the big three car manufacturers and truck manufacturers have been around for a long time, controlled, monopolized the trade forever, faced competition finally in the 70s and 80s, and then had to readjust to this, and now we're at a point, by the way, where we're probably going to start seeing uh, 3D printing of cars and vehicles. You're not even going to see the movement of cars and vehicles anymore on car carriers. You'll just 3D print out everything and assemble cars and assembly plants. So I don't know if cars and trucks are the good analogy. Train over half. We. We'll I don't know that much about trains, so I'm going to leave that. Some some train expert can talk about trains. Only do this for our most efficient method of transport. That is the very definition of idiocy from my point of view. Not when you understand why this happens. Again, I go back to the issue, why was the Jones Act passed in 1920? It was passed because of a national defense, national security issue, where we found ourselves with our commerce in the hands of foreign shipping. And then when that foreign shipping disappeared, we had to rely on our coastal transport, ships that were built, ships that were operated, ships that were owned, ships that were crewed in the United States. Guess what? We find ourselves in that same situation today, except the Jones Act has been gutted by the interstate highway system, the interstate pipeline system, intercontinental aircraft, intercontinental railways, and the fact that countries around the world heavily, heavily subsidize their shipbuilding so that you try to compare the cost of building a ship in the United States versus building one in China, which heavily subsidizes, or Korea or Japan, or the fact that U.S. ships cost more to operate because you have to pay them a certain wage that they think they deserve versus a foreign crew from the Philippines, Russia, China, India, or Indonesia that earn a minimum wage, a minimum wage of $21 a day. I, I, I don't know. Yeah, you can't quite compete with that. But at the same time, Peter will argue for onshoring things, bringing things back. 
and making ourselves more self-sufficient, but except when it comes to shipping. And again, you know, to blame all our trouble, literally, and he did, he blamed all our trouble. He said it's the number one issue, it's the stupidest law, and it's hurt our development. I, I find that hard to fathom. Hence, better call Sal. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. Leave a comment. I'm sure I'll have some comments. Peter, come on, bring it on. I'd love to talk to Peter about this. Let's go ahead. I am more than well willing to do that. Let's bring it on. Craig Fuller, my buddy, had him on at a Freight Waves event. I was dying to be there for that because I'd love to talk to Peter about this. I think it would be a fun talk. I really would. I'd have to get a new tie, and I can't put my hair in a, in, in a bun. But, you know, I'll do the best to be like Peter. I can let the beard grow and try to do my best. But I, that's, that's about it. Leave that comment. Share it across social media. Give it a thumbs up. And if you can, if you can support the page. How do you support the page? Well, number one, I'm going to need support because I'm going to need new blood pressure medicine based on what I'm watching here. But you hit that super thanks button below. You can head on over to Patreon, become a monthly patron of the show. We have different levels you can subscribe to monthly or yearly and help support the page. Until our next video, this is Sal signing off. I got to take a break for a few minutes.